Hare Krishna. Welcome everyone. Today, tonight, we're going to do a course, a very interesting course called the 10, what's it called? The, the 10, I forgot the name of it. Hold on a second. Um, it just shows how unprepared I am. The 10 Habits of Highly Ineffective People. So you may wonder, why would, why would I talk about that? And is this going to make everybody feel bad? Would you find out that you have habits of ineffective people? Well, it was kind of a title to grab attention, but um, I've noticed over the years actions that we do, that many of us do, maybe all of us do, or we used to do, that are ineffective and um, somewhat dysfunctional, depending on how deep the problem is. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to do what's right, and it's easier in the beginning just to stop doing what's wrong. And obviously, when we find out what's wrong, we, we should be doing the opposite. But sometimes that's difficult. But, and, and sometimes also we're doing something wrong, and we don't even know it's wrong. So that's the idea. And Sundari Radha did uh, <laughs> Midnight in South Africa. Okay, I'll try to keep you awake. Sundari Radha, did I give you the document so that you could post um, point by point? So, disclaimer, I don't want you to feel like there's something wrong with you if you can identify with these, I think practically practically everything that we have that's wrong. Okay, I'll I'll see if I can send you the document. If I uh, my computer cooperates. Okay, hold on. So I'm, I'm going to send it to Sundari Radha and then one by one. I just want you to post one by one as we're doing this. And I have a very bad internet connection. I'm not even sure that I'm going to be able to get it to you. But we'll see what happens. And um, so as a disclaimer, I don't want anyone walking away from this feeling like, oh, I have all these and I'm so bad and so forth. Midnight in Poland, okay, we're gonna have to keep a lot of you awake. So if you want, you can take notes and, and we could probably spend, there's 10 of these, we could probably spend one hour to five hours on each one. So this potentially could be 50 hours. But, um, okay. So it looks like we're going to be able to send this. I'm just talking a little bit in the hopes that we can send this and you'll read it because the signal is almost non-existent. Oh, it went. Okay. So, Sundari Rod, I want you to look for that. It's got sent over the ocean. So, these are things for you to reflect on. And um, obviously, we need to go more deeply into this. And we may go more deeply into this later. We'll see what your response is. And, and so this, you know, if we get through all 10, it will be a brief overview, but you can kind of look at these things. Okay, so number one, 10 habits of highly ineffective people. Oh, yeah, the other thing is that you might look at some of these and say, well, I don't have that problem. But, but one advantage of discussing this is that some people have this problem and you can help them. I'm thinking. Hold on.
last night I was thinking excuse me, that I could sit like this because the problem is that behind me is that window that's open and it seems to be problematic for the camera because it kind of has to um, deal with that and this light coming in. So I think that's better, no? Anyway, if it's better or not, I think we'll just use this for now. That's okay. So, if you don't feel that these are qualities that you have or possess or dysfunctions you have or they're not serious because everybody has some level of dysfunction, we're all not perfect, but you can, you can take this class also to be able to help people that you notice who have this problem. And some of these problems are, they're also due to philosophical misunderstandings. So, number one, you don't like yourself. That's the first, it's the first habit of highly ineffective people, they don't like themselves. And so, Sundari Lada, can you put that number one up? And so that way everybody, if they want to take notes, I can write it down. And this is what I have written to explain this. If you don't like yourself, no one else will. If you treat yourself like dirt, so will everyone else. Yeah, so there. Sundar Yarada put it up. You can read along. If you don't like yourself, you will expect others to make you happy and make you feel good about yourself. Okay, so let's let's dissect this first from a philosophical perspective. I think that putting ourselves down for some devotees seems to be something that we're supposed to do, that it's like in our tradition and, and it's actually healthy and maybe unhealthy not to put ourselves down. Okay, so let's look at that first. Anything that you do that inspires you, anything you do that detaches you, anything you do that brings you to closer to Krishna is good. It's healthy. It must be. But anything you do that doesn't inspire you, anything you do that makes you miserable, not blissful, not ecstatic, anything you do that's discouraging you, anything you do that's causing you to not be inspired, anything you do that causes you to become materially attached, anything you do that's not bringing you closer to Krishna must be something that's not favorable for bhakti. And so sometimes something in and of itself looks like it's Krishna conscious, but when you look at the result, the result is not Krishna conscious. And so oftentimes, especially younger devotees, misunderstand how to practice humility, and the way they do it is by putting themselves down. And it actually, in, in many cases, it actually harms them. It doesn't help them. It doesn't inspire them. But they think putting themselves is down because our acharyas did the same thing. But the difference is that when our acharyas do that, it's, it's a byproduct of their bhakti. And so it, it's not even a question, is it healthy or not healthy? It's coming from love of Krishna, because as you love Krishna, you feel smaller. You feel others are better. You, you feel you're lacking. That's a symptom of being Krishna conscious. But when you're not on that level and you feel that way artificially, it will generally or often have the opposite effect. It won't inspire you. It will discourage you. So that's, some, that's just a, a baseline understanding of at any time you're acting or thinking in a particular way and you think it's Krishna conscious, well, how do you know it's Krishna consciousness? Well, is it inspiring you? Is it detaching you? Is it, is it awakening your attraction to Krishna? Is it helping you in your spiritual life? 
And if the answer is no, it's actually depressing or discouraging me. It's making me beat myself up. It's making me feel bad about myself. That can never be productive. So you might say, but it looks like the Acharyas feel bad about themselves. But it's just like separation. Separation seems painful, but when you study what separation is, it actually you see that it increases ecstasy. So this kind of humility, it looks like they're just demeaning themselves or even punishing themselves. But it's actually evoking ecstasy. It's actually coming from ecstasy. So if we don't understand that and then we imitate that and we do that to ourselves, it can backfire and it can have a negative effect. So now, now I once did an exercise which I found extremely interesting. And, and I have to admit it was awkward and I have to admit it didn't feel like this is what Krishna consciousness is all about, but it had a very good effect on me. And it was a devotee who was a, who was a counselor and he had a group of us and we paired up and he said, tell the other person what you like about yourself. And I thought, well, that's not really what a devotee does because it sounds like we're being arrogant or we're tooting our own horn. But, but actually that wasn't the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise, it was for ourselves to recognize the good qualities we have or uh, being part of Krishna, the, the qualities Krishna has and uh, given us and to reflect on um, how I appreciate that I have these qualities because I can use these qualities in Krishna's service. Thank you, Krishna, for giving me the ability to blank. Not that a devotee should think, I don't have any good qualities. And if you see any good qualities in me, actually, you're just an illusion. It's not true. No, but Prabhu, you led a nice kirtan. No, it was, you're just an illusion. I, I have no good qualities. I don't lead nice kirtan. Oh, but Prabhu, you gave a nice class. No. I don't give nice classes. It, it was, you're just an illusion. You just, you're just Krishna conscious, so you think it's nice. But actually, no, I don't. That's, that's not recognizing the talents Krishna has given you is not the definition of humility. But recognizing those talents, humbly recognizing them. Yes, Krishna has given me this talent. It's he who has given me. That's humility. Denying it is not humility recognizing where it comes from is humility. So Krishna has given me this talent, I can use that in his service. That's humility. Denying that I have and saying, I don't like myself, I don't have any good qualities. That's not humility. If you become Krishna conscious, you'll naturally have good qualities. You'll be endowed with good qualities. That's a fact, right? And so it's not humility to deny that. What humility is, is to utilize what Krishna has given. Just let's say, for example, you're wealthy. And I know you're wealthy. And then you tell me, I'm not wealthy. I just say, no, you're wealthy. No, no, I'm really poor. Then you're just lying. So you may be wealthy in certain qualities. You may be a great writer, a great singer, a great artist a great teacher, a great manager, a great whatever. So it's not humility to deny that. And actually, if you recognize those qualities in you and you appreciate it, it's a way of thanking Krishna. Thank you, Krishna, for giving me these qualities. I can use them in your service. I'm happy to have these qualities which I can use in your service. So so um, what do we say? To just deny that you have good qualities and everything about you is bad and wrong and, and not like yourself. It's not a healthy state of consciousness. It's not symptomatic of being Krishna conscious. And I think sometimes devotees think, well, that's what it means to be Krishna conscious, to demean yourself. So when this devotee said, tell your partner what you like about yourself, everybody felt awkward as devotees because we don't normally do that. But then when I did the exercise, what happened, at least for me, and, and I would imagine for many devotees, if not all of us, I started to appreciate that Krishna has given me certain qualities which I've been using in devotional service. And I 
started to appreciate, well, it's, you know, I can recognize, yes, I have this ability. I wasn't saying it in a proud way, but I just recognize that I have it. And I'm so grateful that I have it because I can use that in Krishna's service. So that was the result. Now, here's a fact, because I've experimented with this, and I will explain to you the results of my experiments. If someone does not like themselves, if someone tends to put themselves down, if if it is in a, at a disease level, like it's okay, you know, you can be humble, you can put yourself down, it, it not necessarily would be unhealthy. Because if you have a healthy sense of self and self-appreciation, you could put yourself down as, as an act of humility. No, I'm not that great. Thank you for complimenting me. I don't think I'm such a, a great writer, a great speaker, but I appreciate that you you see that in me, thank you, like that. So that, that would be more of a healthy way. You're not denying at the same time. You're not becoming proud, but you're not demeaning yourself. Oh, I'm actually, I'm useless. And I'm, you know, I wrote that book, but it was an accident. I, I don't know how it happened. You're, you're not artificially being humble. If you have a, a seriously, a, a serious, you know, how should we say it? If you have a serious case of lack of self-esteem, if it's at a crucially deficient level, then when you're asked to say something you like about yourself, you can't say anything. You just stop. And sometimes you actually start crying because you realize you don't like yourself. There's nothing about yourself you, that you like. That is an unhealthy condition. That is a dysfunctional condition. And so, if when you heard me say this exercise and it made you feel bad or it made you think I don't have any good qualities, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overlook that. I would take that seriously. That's a problem. That's not normal. So that's an indication of a seriously low or seriously depleted level of self-esteem that just to look at what you like about yourself. No, I don't like anything about myself. Now, two more things I want to say. And I've spoken about this at length, and the purpose of this is to highlight these, these 10, just so you kind of get an overview. If, as I said here, if you don't like yourself, unfortunately, what it does is it it, it kind of communicates that subtly. And we see that many people who don't like themselves almost feel like they deserve to suffer, like there's something wrong with them and they de deserve to suffer. And unfortunately, that communicates to people who like to make other people suffer or, ha or who have the capacity to make other people suffer. And so that's unfortunate. And we've seen that. And maybe many of you have seen that. It's unfortunate. So... If, if I abuse myself, it, it it's almost sends out a subtle invitation to other people to abuse me. And so we have to be very careful because this happens. You may think, no, this is just like new age hodgepodge. No, it actually happens. I've seen it again and again and again, and it's, it's documented within the field of psychology. How you treat yourself sends a message that others should treat you so treat you the same way. So if you have self-respect, you'll be more respected. If you lack self-respect, people will tend to disrespect you. They'll cross your boundaries. They'll mistreat you. So that that's something to consider. The other point I made was was when we lack uh, enough self-confidence, or we we how should we we. Here's a situation that, that happens often that somebody is intelligent or somebody is attractive or somebody is capable, but they think I'm not intelligent, I'm not attractive, I'm not capable, when in fact they are. And because they feel they aren't, they need to get encouragement, they need to build up their sense of self by getting other people to tell them they are because they tell themselves they're not. So the problem with that, or the potential problem with that, which makes this so dysfunctional, is that if you don't have a certain level of self-respect, 
then you depend on other people to give it to you. So you have expectations for people to show you respect and honor to a to often to a degree that's not normal, that in normal interactions, people would not show that much respect or affection or honor. And then the problem is because you need that to gain your own self-respect, when you don't get it from them, then you become resentful or, or upset or angry. And the only reason you're upset or angry is because you're, there's something in you that's lacking that you need from other people. And if you didn't need that, then not getting it wouldn't upset you because you'd be you'd be full with it. Right? And one of the things that you can do, if you fall in that category or you know someone who falls in that category, is to start appreciating yourself more, to start giving yourself what you're expecting from others. So you, you want others to recognize your intelligence. Well, why don't you recognize it? And now you might say, well, that seems like pride. But the thing is, if you have intelligence and you don't recognize it, you'll tend not to use it in Krishna service. It's like having money in the bank, but you don't realize you have, or you're in denial. And so you don't use it. And, and you have all this wealth you could be using for Krishna, but you deny that you have it. And so you don't use it. So it's not against our philosophy to recognize what you have. It's against our philosophy to think that you created it. That is Krishna's qualities, Krishna's ability Krishna's intelligence that he's giving you. And to recognize it means I recognize what I have so I can use it. So to be to acknowledge my own sense of self-worth means I don't rely on other people. I don't expect other people to give it to me. I don't need other people to give it to me. So if you lack that, you need to give it to yourself and you need to recognize your good qualities and you need to be able to tell somebody, this is what I like about myself. So if you have difficulty with any of these things, then that becomes a handicap in your, your ability to function. So, and the more it's a problem, the more you become dysfunctional, the more your relationships suffer, the more you become depressed or upset or disempowered. So, does anyone have any questions before I go to number two? It is six o'clock here. Wow. Jyoti Gopi, what time is it in India? Like 3.30 a.m.? It's got to be early there, right? Okay. No questions. Number two. I'll wait a few seconds because there's a delay here. Okay, good. I explained everything. It's such a depressing topic. No one wants to talk about it. Okay, but if you're interested in this topic, I did a whole series on it, and it's called self-compassion and self-envy, or self-love and self-envy. You can look for it on SoundCloud. It's very important. Many, many people. 4 a.m. and well, it's almost 4 a.m. in India. Okay, not so early. Um, the cure is to give yourself what you lack. So if you lack self-love, you have to give yourself love. If you lack self-respect, you have to give yourself self-respect. Whatever it is, you, if, you, if you think you're stupid, you have to recognize how you're smart and in what ways you're smart and so that you build your self-esteem. There's, there's another... There's another layer of this because self-esteem, self-confidence, they're, they're similar. And a lot of times, if we don't have self-confidence, it's not a problem. Or if we feel unqualified, it's not a problem. Because we have self-confidence with a capital S. We have confidence in Krishna, that Krishna can do what I can't. So even if I lack self-confidence, it doesn't have to be dis disempowering if I put my confidence in Krishna. So, well, Krishna Priya, um, let me just explain something that will make this more clear. Let's say you, from the point of view of intelligence, from the point of view of capability, 
from the point of view of, of your values, of your goodness, of who you are. Let's say it, it rates on a scale of one to 10 here. Okay, so let's say this is six or seven out of 10. If you have low self-esteem, you'll rate yourself much lower than it actually is. You'll think, no, it's about a three. I, I'm not that smart, I'm not that good, I'm not that this, I'm not, I'm actually down here. So when someone has low self-esteem, they estimate themselves lower than they actually are. And so oftentimes you find people with low self-esteem, um, the reason it's somewhat dysfunctional is because they actually think they're worse than they are and they and they don't what, how you think of yourself is is how you tend to operate so if i don't think i'm good at something i'll tend even if i am i'll tend to operate on the lower level because it's just the conception has psyched me out to think that i i can't do it on this level for example let's say you want to do something your parents say you'll never do that you're not good enough and you believe it then it's going to be difficult. You'll probably fail, even though you could do it, even though you're here, but your parents or someone told you you're here and you'll fail. So unless you believe that you're here, you won't be successful. So low self-esteem is you, your reality is here, but your, your perception of your reality is down here. And so you operate down here because how you think of yourself is how you operate. So if you think... I'm actually not that good, I'm actually not that smart, you'll tend to act that way, even though you are good at it and you are smart. It psychs you out. This is just um, a principle of psychology. You cannot act differently than the conception you have of yourself. Now, let's take it the other way. This is where it gets kind of interesting and I think it clarifies what we're talking about. So let's say you're here, Krishna Priya, but you think you're here, okay? That's called low self-esteem. Now, if, you, if you're if you here and you think you're here, that's kind of normal, most people. Most people kind of underestimate or a little bit overestimate. So, you know, this area here around where you're at, you'd say it's kind of healthy. Some people think they're better than they are. Some people think they're worse than they are, right? But when it gets too low, it's called low self-esteem. And when it gets too high, it's called arrogance. They're both compensations. Okay, I'm actually here, but the arrogant person doesn't want to admit he's here. He wants to think he's better. So he has this conception of himself, and everybody can understand he's not what he thinks he is. He thinks he's much better than he is. And person with low self-esteem is down here, and everyone can say, He's not that low. He's actually here, but he thinks he's here. And the arrogant person thinks he's here, but he's actually here. So, but here's where it gets interesting. Some people who are here who feel incompetent or unintelligent, the way they make up for it, the way, the way they look for their strength is to become arrogant, to show off, to get the applause of other people, to build up their ego and so-called self-esteem. So really what we're looking for is not this or this. We're looking to be objective about where we're at. And one of the problems of not knowing where you're at is that you can't act rationally and you can't make progress from where you're at. You're at Because if you're up here, you're going to try to do things that are impossible. You're going to become too proud. And if you're down here, you may restrain yourself from doing what you can do. And it'll tend to be have a negative effect. So these are both dysfunctions, but it's just, they come out in different ways. And isn't it interesting that someone's down here, someone tries to balance, somehow often tries to balance it by trying to show off and get applause. So, yeah, there's still there's some comments here. So, I mean, this is a big topic, but um, the reason I brought this up is that a functional person will not be proud, he won't be arrogant, and he won't have low self-esteem. He'll just have a very objective idea of where he's at, and he'll be accepting of that. And, and 
the problem with a lot of us is we don't like where we're at and, and we beat ourselves up for where we're at rather than just accepting where we're at and then from there working on herself. Because if you don't accept where you're at, it has a negative effect on you. And it's harder to improve yourself because it, it, it creates this negativity like an apathetic, I, I'm so bad, what's the use? And I don't have the energy to improve or I don't want to improve. Where if you accept, okay, this is where I'm at and it's okay, but I want to be better and I can be better, but I'm not going to demean myself for this. It's just, this is the reality and I will work to improve myself. And the point is you can continually improve yourself throughout your life. But when you demean yourself, it, it corrupts that process. It slows it down or even stops it or even makes it go down. If, it's, if, you're, if you have a serious, seriously low self-esteem, you might, instead of improving over the long run, you just, you kind of stay in the negative below zero. So that's the problem. So healthy people have a healthy sense of, of self-esteem but it's not pride, it's just, it, it's, it's self-acceptance and an acknowledgement of where I'm good, but not, not proud, just, okay, I'm happy that Krishna has given me this ability. Like Krishna Priya, you have certain academic abilities. So to, to walk around and say, I don't have them, after you've got your master's degree, it doesn't make sense to say that. Or I was just lucky or whatever. It, it doesn't make sense. You can recognize that without becoming proud and you acknowledge, yes, Krishna, I have this academic ability. Thank you for giving it to me. I can use that. That's all. That's it. That's healthy. And that still maintains your humility. Right? You understand? You, you can acknowledge and maintain your ability, your humility at the same time, simply by recognizing where this comes from. Demeaning yourself Putting yourself down, at least on our level, is a symptom of the mode of ignorance. And being in the mode of ignorance is damaging. It's not going to help us. So we want to be sattvic. And so anytime we exhibit behavior or attitudes which are tamasic, obviously we're being affected by tamagun. And if we're affected by tamagun, it damages our Krishna consciousness. Obvious, right? So a lot of these dysfunctions we're going to be talking about are symptomatic of people in tamagun. And tamagun is the guna of dysfunction. Anyone in tamagun is a highly dysfunctional person. And anyone in sabagun is a highly functional person, both materially and spiritually. That's where your willpower is the strongest in sabagun. That's where your determination is the strongest. That's where the virtues reside in tamagun. And, and excuse me, in sabagun. And, in Tamagun, it's where all the bad qualities reside. The lack of willpower, the lack of sense control, all the depression and the madness and the mental disease and dysfunction, the emotional dysfunction, it all resides in Tamagun. So as devotees, we're cultivating goodness. Goodness also means light, bright, happy. And so there's, if you cultivate goodness, it will shed light on your bad qualities, but it won't depress you. Whereas your tamagun, it will depress you. If you even see your bad qualities, if you even recognize them. But if you're disposed to putting yourself down, it's probably because you grew up with somebody putting you down, making you feel bad about yourself and making you feel like you, you can never do anything good. So one thing I think that, that's very important in understanding this is is the history of how people end up like this. Some people come in to this body with this mentality and, and they brought it from a last life. But still, they had to most likely be in a situation where they were being put down. And being put down long enough, they began to believe it. And that narrative of you're bad or you're not good enough, which was told to them, then becomes adopted some subconsciously by them, and that becomes their story that they tell themselves. And that's why it's, it's, it, it's almost addictive or, or habit-forming, because they've heard it so, for so long, and they've believed it for so long, and they've lived it for so long, it becomes their reality. So it has to be broken, 
because it's a it's not reality but it was programmed into them by somebody who was putting them down so if you understand this you'll be able to see it in others and you'll be able to help others and one of the ways you help others is by helping them understand that what they're telling themselves is not true it's it's someone else who had their own problems was telling you that why aren't you good enough or blaming you and it was you know anyone blames you it's their problem it's not your problem anyone who puts you down 99 percent of the time it's their problem it's not what you did it's their own uh, way to deal with their own issues by you know, taking it out on another person so you have to realize that that oftentimes it's someone else putting putting you down so one of the things we want to learn from this is if you are having to correct someone you're having to help someone don't ever make them feel if they did something wrong don't ever let them feel like there's something wrong with them you only want to let them understand that they did something wrong and you're trying to correct the thing they did wrong and what they did wrong exists in a vacuum it is not inclusive of everything in their life and everything about them personally it's one isolated event that could be improved and so you want to make sure that that's the message they get and when people have low self-esteem when you tell them you need to improve in this way or this was done wrong they'll they'll take it what they'll hear is there something wrong with me and they'll, they can get very upset with you that's a low self-esteem issue so when you're dealing with someone who has low self-esteem you want to help them understand that and you have to be a little sensitive to them because you can do little things and they can get hurt and you had no intention of hurting them and what you did was very innocent and when they express hurt then you can understand okay this person has low self-esteem so they take everything personally and you, you'll be surprised when someone will say you know you did this and hurt me and you're trying to think why would that hurt you i was just i was was just making this point and they say yeah but you must have been talking about me no i wasn't talking about you. it was just a point i was making but you said this and that describes me well i didn't know that describes you it's very very sensitive and you go okay this person has low self-esteem so we never want them to feel like we're attacking them personally because naturally that's how they feel why oh you know you were late you said you'd come on time oh you're saying i'm bad there's something wrong with me is that what you're saying no i just said you're late we have to you know we want to start the meeting on time could you come on time? oh so you don't like me right so so you don't want me on the team is that what you're saying that that's brewing inside of them so that's how they interpret and also if that's how you respond then you should understand you're dealing with this problem because that's not the way a person with healthy self-esteem will respond they'll just go yeah i am late i'm sorry i shouldn't be late i'll be on time and it's over it's not an issue but the low self-esteem person it can be an issue like well, i don't even, i don't want to be on this team because i don't want to work with you because you have no respect for me and everyone's looking at that and thinking all he did was ask them, could you be on time next week? And there's this, this whole tirade and monologue. And, you know, it's like a, have you seen that before? You just, you touch the person and it's like you've just touched a boil in their heart. That's a sign of low self-esteem. Um, um, okay. Okay, so Yvonne, I read your comment, Katie. What about people who treat others in, in an inappropriate way, bad word? Do they have a lack of love and self-respect for themselves? It's possible. Um, people who need to put down others often need to validate or rationalize um, their misbehavior by, by not taking responsibility for it, by blaming others. Um, people who criticize, people who complain are expressing a need and they don't know how to express it in a healthy way. And uh, these are signs of various dysfunctions that could be for different reasons. But 
you know, if someone is always critical, always putting people down, there's something wrong. I think we all intuitively understand there's something wrong. You know, sometimes you see these people on the internet and they've never said anything nice about anybody. They find people to attack and they attack people who don't even do anything wrong. And they turn it into something wrong. And then you can understand, okay, this person has problems. If you, if you have to turn a normal activity into something wrong and try to embarrass this person and try to make a point that, you know, the gurus in Iskan are bogus or whatever the point is you want to make, we can understand, okay, this person is not healthy. So if, if, if we lack affection, if we lack respect, or someone lacks affection or respect, that's not normal. You know, there's something going on that has to be dealt with. And often the problem is they won't admit it. And that's unfortunate. But if we have these problems and we can admit it, then we can work on it. So Stephanie says, uh, we made an exercise in the temple to tell everyone a uh, person's qualities that we see in them, the good qualities. And it was curious because most of the devotees couldn't see their own qualities. Yeah, exactly. That's such a good point. You go around and you tell what you like in other people. And when people hear that, they're like shocked that anyone would see those qualities in them. That is such a good exercise, both for the person doing it and the person receiving it, to, to realize that people see me in ways I don't see myself. There was this, this amazing experiment they did, and it illustrated this point. So there was an artist, and he was drawing a portrait, but he couldn't see the person, and the person would describe themselves and say, well, what do you like? Well, I like this and like that. And he would draw the portrait from their description. Then they would bring in people that knew them and say, what are they like? And he would draw the portrait. And in many, many cases, the portrait of themselves was like a miserable, 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 miserable. And the portrait that other people told was beautiful. And when they saw that, they understood that, yeah, this is how I see myself. But it's a... It's been, you know, programmed in there for many people. And also, I think another thing that I've noticed in, in the reason that this is a problem, it's not always programmed in there consciously. It's not always that anyone ever told you there was anything wrong with you. But because the emphasis our society puts on beauty and wealth and success, it's often easy to think there's something wrong with you. After all, you didn't go to a prestigious university. After all, you don't have a high paid position in a high, a Fortune 500 company. After all, you're a few kgs overweight. After all, you're not the most beautiful or handsome person on your block. And so you, started, you start to do these comparisons. And these comparisons make you, you're comparing yourself to who? Rock stars, movie stars, the richest people in the world, the most beautiful people in the world, um, the people you see, you know, American Idol or whatever idol you're watching that have voices like Gandharva's, then you sing and you think, yeah, I used to think I sing nicely. Till I saw them, I decided to stop thinking. Or I used to think that I was beautiful until I saw all these models. Or I used to think I had a good build or figure till I saw all these models and all these weightlifters. You know, it's like, there's so much emphasis on that that it's very easy to think there's something wrong with me. And now, now with Facebook and YouTube and like everyone and their brother can be out there in front of the world and you, and you get to see all these talented people you would never see and you realize there's so many talented people out there and you realize how many talented people are more talented than you. And you think, what's the use? You know, I'm not that good. And so... All of this is impacting us. And if we're not careful, then we start to think, yeah, I'm just bad. There's nothing good in me and so forth. And that is a dysfunctional way to behave. And you're not going to be successful, very successful in anything 
if you think that way, and you're going to cause a lot of trouble to other people, and it's going to lead to uh, a lot of resentment for people who you perceive are mistreating you by not giving you what you're lacking that you should be giving yourself, or you shouldn't be lacking in the first place. Does that make sense to all of you? So Lucy says, uh, it's now a quarter to 1 a.m., and she's still awake. I've kept you awake, Lucy. I'm doing a good job. The need, the want for applause sounds like my fellow colleagues and music students. Creates a toxic mood, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people want to be on stage, maybe to perform part of it, but to be applauded is a, you know, it's a, it's a deep need. And, and so we all want to be applauded, okay? So we all want to be applauded, that's okay. But these things are, you know, we could say, well, everything I'm talking about is normal to a little degree. It's normal we want respect. It's normal we want to be loved. It, it, it's normal we, we sometimes don't realize that we're as good as we are. Okay. But if it's little, it's just normal. <clears throat> the problem is when it's not little. So, Shamamayi has a question. Should we avoid those who put us down if they are not changing, or do we work on ourselves more? Well, the problem is if you live with those people and you can't do anything about it, yeah, you just have to, you know, create boundaries and, and ask them to give you, you know, to respect your boundaries. But in some cases, for some people, yeah, it's it's it exacerbates the problem by being around those people, and it's better to be around people who are supportive. I've seen that sometimes when people suffer from low self-esteem, it can be healed more easily than you think if they're just around people who, who will respect them and who will see them for what they are and not put them down. But if you're, my wife was just saying, we did a class last night on marriage. She was saying that it's a common problem in her counseling that she runs into, and it's that Oftentimes, when one partner puts down another, and it's usually the man putting down the woman, what is common is that he'll blame her. And it could be the woman, but I think it's more common with men. He'll blame her. You're this, you're that, and all their problems are because of you and this and that. And it's so regular and so steady that even though it's not true, she starts to believe it. Yeah, it must be me, you know, because he keeps saying this, so it must be that I'm doing something wrong. And so she loses her, her self-esteem. She's not actually doing anything wrong or not seriously wrong. But because of that constant, constant blaming, she buys into it and starts to demean herself. And so living with someone like that can be dangerous because it can destroy you psychologically. So we have to be careful. And I think some of you listening have experience of this. Yeah, and Katie has experience. You could read her comment, but she's not. She's gone through it. And, um, and Katie says you can get out of it by surrounding yourself with positive people. Okay, so that was fifteen minutes on number on the first one. Yeah, I told you, I could go for five more hours on this. Yeah. And um, okay, so. We recognize this, to sum this up a little, we recognize this in ourselves and we recognize it in others so we can help them. And, you know, one, one great thing that I've experienced, and maybe you've experienced this also, if you have problems like this, in, in a sense, it's actually a blessing because if you can go through this and heal yourself, you, you become empowered to be able to help other people much you know some people just read a book or listen to a lecture or they understand things intellectually and then they try to help people but if you've been through it then you become the ideal person to help people who are going through the same thing because you're not talking from theory you're you're expressing your own experience and you're communicating emotionally and it's very very effective so if you're going through this or suffering and need to heal from this, 
if you get through it, you're going to be a great asset to other people who are going through this. And I can guarantee you, this is a pandemic. Low self-esteem is a pandemic. It's a huge problem. And the last thing, we just touched on this, but if you enter into a relationship and you have low self-esteem, you become, as I said, overly dependent on the other person to treat you in a certain way. And it puts so much pressure on that person that they, they can never meet your expectations because your expectations are so high. And it can create huge problems in relationships. So if you're married or you want to be married and you're dealing with issues of low self-esteem, as a service to your partner and as a service to your relationship, you really need to work on it and heal it. Now, there's another cure, Krishna Priya, for serious cases. Um, and when you're deeply programmed to berate yourself, beat yourself up, put yourself down, demean yourself, if that is like a deeply conditioned response to everything, then there are programs that you can purchase, or it may be free on the internet, where you can go sub to do subconscious reprogramming of those beliefs. Because when you demean yourself to that level, there's a core belief that I'm not worthy, or I'm not good, or I'm bad, something of that nature. And if that can be reprogrammed, then the problem gets solved, and you start to feel like, no, I'm okay. I'm worthy, I, I'm respectable, and so forth. Uh, one more thing I want to say, which is directly affects, directly affects our Krishna consciousness, is if you have this core belief that I'm not good or I'm not worthy of being loved or cared for, which is, part, is often part of this whole thing, then what happens is sometimes I get letters and devotees will write me and say, I've stopped chanting my rounds, or I don't chant my rounds every day, or I'm not following all the principles. And my gut response, my gut intuition to this is, you need to respect yourself more. You need to have more affection for yourself. Because if you respect yourself more, you would respect the vow you made. And you would respect the person more who you made the vow to. That how can I, I, I've made a vow to this person, I have to respect it. I made a vow to myself, I have to respect it. So when we berate ourselves too much, we, we lose our sense of self-respect, self-care, self-love, and that can erode into this where we stop following principles or practices, stop doing things we should do, and also start doing things we shouldn't do. That is often a lack of self-love, self-respect. So there's a mantra I want to give you. And it's a very powerful mantra if you can imbibe this mantra. And the mantra goes like this. If you're tempted or if you're challenged because you're not fulfilling a vow, tell yourself, I respect myself too much to break that vow. I have too much compassion for myself to do this, to break this principle, to give in to this. I have too much affection for myself to sleep in late. I have too much respect and love for myself to not chant my rounds. I have too much respect and love for my guru not to follow my vows. So more self, you know, you know, if you listen to the like first part of this talk, you might think, well, he's just talking pure psychology. But when you actually frame it in the context of Krishna consciousness, then you see, you can see how much it can affect your Krishna consciousness. At a core level, it can erode your ability to follow the practice because you lose self-respect. And when you lose self-respect, it starts to become replaced by apathy. And when that apathy comes in, it's like, well, I don't care. I know I promised, but I don't care. And I'm sure you can relate to this. So when you have more self-love, self-compassion, self-respect, then you'll do that. The, the, other, the other day I was in a situation where I was, I, was, I was feeling that in the position I'm in, I have a lot of responsibility in the sense 
that people are counting on me to set a good example. And that Prabhupada has given me the responsibility for the lives of so many people who are counting on me. And I was thinking to myself, Srila Prabhupada, this is what you want me to do, and I will never let you down. My, my love for you, my affection for you is, I won't let you down, even if it's hard for me. I won't let you down. This is, this is what you want for me, and you've given so much to me, and this is what I want to give back. So that feeling of respect and love, dedication for the guru, that's a very healthy consciousness which empowers you to be able to follow through on the things the guru gave you. My guru has given me this instruction. My guru is depending on me to do this. I cannot let him down. I have, I have enough self-respect that when I commit to him, when he gives an instruction, I do it. So when we erode that self-respect, then it's very easy to start rationalizing, saying, yeah, I didn't do it, but, and then you get all the, you know, reasons. So, you know, I'm overcome, it's this, you know, I'm home all day, and you know, I'm in a mode of ignorance, and I just can't get it together. So, tell yourself, I have too much self-respect to not do it. I, I would never allow myself to fall away from the orders of my guru. I would never allow myself to give in to anything that could be destructive to my bhakti. And you will see, just by saying that, you might say, but I don't believe that. Just say it. I love myself too much to blank, and whatever it is. Just say it, and if you say it, you're going to start to feel it, and you're going to start to realize that maybe it is a lack of self-respect that I'm giving in. And if I respect myself more, then I will do A, B, C, and D. Does that make sense? That's a very powerful mantra. I love myself too much to blank. I honor my guru too much to blank. And the blank is all the things that I could potentially do wrong or I am doing wrong. I honor my guru too much to let him down. I honor myself too much to let myself down. It's powerful. Try that. And some, some, why, why don't one of you write that down and put it on Facebook? The mantra. I honor myself too much to allow, to allow myself, to, to honor myself too much to give in to anything that could be destructive for my spiritual life or my material life. That makes sense? Yes, it does. So he says, Because I got Julia awake. Wow, I'm doing good. I'm excited, you know. I've got to keep you excited. It's 1 a.m. in Poland. Hare Krishna. Um, mm -hmm. The negative voice, the nagging voice. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Low self esteem attracts narcissism in a partner. Maybe I'm not. I'm not um, educated in that area, but it's possible. But low self-esteem can, it can entice another person to take advantage of you because you'll let them. So to have boundaries is, is not wrong. It's not, I, think, I think part of the problem is a lot of times we think, well, if I protect myself, if I have boundaries and so forth, it's not Krishna conscious, but that's not true. Because you have to protect yourself to be Krishna conscious. That's the point. Now look at it this way. There's another way. There's another way to frame this. Well, this class is probably not going to get to number two. Anyway, if it's one a week, we have ten weeks. So if you have to do something, protect yourself in a certain way, think in a certain way, act in a certain way, to maintain your Krishna consciousness then doing that is not to be, you shouldn't um, feel guilty about doing that because that's what you have to do to be Krishna conscious. So if we think that way, then our spiritual life is much easier. But if we feel guilty that, uh, well, you know, I have to do this and that, but it's very selfish and this and that. No, 
there is a kind of selfishness that's necessary. So Prabhupada wants us to become purified. He's given us a program to become purified. He wants us in this life to go back to Godhead. So I need to do certain things to be able to make that happen. And I need to take care of myself in certain ways to make that happen, right? So doing that is necessary. It's not that I should feel guilty or there's something wrong, but it's actually necessary. Does that make sense? So whatever you have to do to uplift yourself, to save yourself, to purify yourself, do it. That's Krishna consciousness. Don't feel guilty. Oh, I had to stay back and you know, I'm chanting extra rounds today because I feel I need it. Don't feel guilty. If you need it, do it. Uh, you know, you're not going to do it every day and do no service. That's a different thing. I'm not talking about that. But doing what you have to do to maintain your Krishna consciousness is the ABCs of bhakti. And it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. There's everything right with it. Angelica, what a nice name. How do you say that? Angelica in Spanish? Angel, Angelica? We say Angelica. So Angelica says, I like Angelica better than Angelica. Is it okay to expect my partner to tell me nice things? Or make a compliment once in a while? Or is that a sign of low self-esteem? No. A sign of low self-esteem would be that you become totally depressed um, when he doesn't give you like 108 comment, compliments a day. Or that point I was making that he corrects you and you know, he says, you know, when you cooked yesterday, you know, you put a little too much salt in the rice. You know, I don't like salt in my rice. So then you, you have a breakdown. That's low self-esteem. Um, if your partner doesn't compliment you, there's probably something wrong with him. Or he's got an issue. And so, yeah, this is an interesting point. Sometimes the problem is with another person, like they don't know how to compliment, they don't know how to appreciate it, they didn't grow up that way, or they don't know how to express themselves. And so because they're not expressing themselves, then you think, oh, must be something wrong with me because he never appreciates me. To want to be appreciated is, is a basic human need. But to want to be appreciated to the extreme, constantly, is a dysfunction. So it's important to understand the difference between healthy human needs and, and human needs that aren't healthy. So yeah, we all want to be appreciated. Now, if we were completely Krishna conscious, maybe not. We would just want to appreciate everyone else. But in our conditioned state, to want some affection and recognition, that's, that's normal. So yes, especially for a woman, if you're not getting some appreciation, it could be difficult. But even for a man, man, you know, behind every um, Caesar was a Cleopatra. A man gets energy from his wife encouraging him. So that, that's normal. As you progress in Krishna consciousness, it will be less. But sometimes you may be with a man who just doesn't know how to do that or want to do that or doesn't feel like it's necessary. I don't want to compliment you because you'll become puffed up. That's, a, that's like a dysfunctional relationship. That's not real. It's not normal. So sometimes what we find in Krishna consciousness is that when we uh, misunderstand the philosophy, then we start acting in ways which are unnatural. Now, I would compliment you, but, you know, really you need to become more humble. And so, you know, I'm not going to say thank you when you cook because then you're going to become proud that, like, you know, you're a great wife and you're a great cook. And that's just, for lack of a better word, that's just stupid. But sometimes we get stupid and we misunderstand the philosophy and apply it in ways which are completely unnatural, unrealistic for a normal relationship. So, yes, it's natural in any healthy relationship to show respect and appreciation. And today I said something funny to my wife, and she said something funny back. It was really interesting. She made some Akadasi cookies. And after I ate one, I didn't need to eat anymore, but they were so good that I ate another one. 
and I and and I was talking to myself and saying these cookies are so good and she heard me say that and then I walked into the room eating a cookie she was in the back in her office and I said I've got a complaint and she said what's the complaint my cookies are too good and I said yeah it was funny she knew that I was going to complain so that that was my complaint which was a compliment so if your husband or wife does something good then it's kind of strange not to appreciate it isn't it in the name of I don't want you to become proud that was that's like very stupid so if one of the partners has a problem appreciating another person that is not good and naturally we want to be appreciated because we want we just you know it's human nature it's one of the six human needs now as you become transcendental it's going to change and you're going to develop a stronger desire to appreciate others. But in a relationship like husband and wife, where you expect affection and you, you, know, you get married to get that affection, then it's kind of natural that you'll want it because that's one of the reasons you get married. And that's something you naturally would res expect from someone who respects you, right? And someone who loves you. So if your boyfriend or husband or girlfriend or wife is not appreciating you. Sometimes it's just not their nature to verbalize it. And so just ask them, do you appreciate what I do? I just want to know because you don't tell me. And, and maybe you're appreciating everything I do, but you don't tell me. So I just want to know, am I doing everything okay? Is it good? And then, and it's, then it gives them a chance to say, yes, I appreciate everything. It's just not my style to verbalize it. And then you could say, you know, it really would help me if you verbalize it, and even though, you know, maybe you don't feel it's necessary, but it would help me if you could do that. I'd really appreciate it. And so that could solve the problem. Anyway, I won't solve everybody's problems, but it's a problem that could be solved possibly that way. Lucy says, please take this class and give it to college students all over the world. It is so important. Okay, so this class will go online afterwards. And why don't you all share it to everyone you want to share it to, and you can transcribe it. You can do what you want with it, and we'll get it to go viral. And we'll help so many people. So you all can, when I put it up, you can get the link and then put it on your Facebook pages and share it and describe it and say what you want. And You know, when I do these classes, I just put them up and I don't say anything. There's no description. And People just go by and it's just like a class every day. Today, this is my third class, so it's like there's so many, you know, you don't notice them. But maybe you could, some of you could notice it and write something and put it in your Facebook page and, and save it. And Lucy, you can um, learn this class and then you can give the class at the university. So Lucy says, I was thinking about this, giving into your environment versus honoring your bhakti and your guru. Thank you for solidifying this in there. In the, um, this is one of, one of there, there's a couple challenges that I consider like huge challenges or obstacles. This is one of them. You know what you want to do, but your environment is pulling you to do something else. And there's two things that are going to happen. You're going give to give in to your environment or you're going to give in to what you know is right. You're going to give in to your own willpower or you're going to let your willpower be smothered by the environment. These are the two choices that we face all the time. And like Krishna Priya, you had written me an email and I, I was just briefly going over it. And I was seeing that this is a challenge that you're having. And I think a lot of us are having now because we're home and the environment, you know, is like just sitting at home with my husband or wife or my family and it's like, oh, this is different than I normally go through. This is this environment is challenging. And so now we can start to look at am I going to be controlled by my environment or am I going to be controlled by what is important to me, what I know is right? Am I going to 
utilize my willpower to do what's right, or am I going to let the environment snuff out my willpower? So this is the challenge all the time. If you look at your life, you'll see you're constantly battling with this environment, people, my own mind's environment, condition environment, versus my willpower, my intelligence, my understanding, my values, my dedication to my vows, my, my understanding of philosophy and what's right, they're always conflicting. And so we, we want to live our life and develop a consciousness so that we can always be giving in, so to speak, to our intelligence, giving in to our integrity, rather than giving in to what the environment is saying. Or, or the internal environment environment of our conditioning, what that's saying and how that's pulling us. That's the challenge. It's one of the main challenges we face at every moment. And lots of people are facing it now because the environment they're in is, is apparently, for many people, is not very conducive to their spiritual lives or their material lives. And they're allowing that environment to upset them. I, I think... Um, it's not so much a problem here where we live because we live on land so we can go out and there's no people and then we drive about five minutes away and there's about 3,000 acre forest and the most people I've ever seen there was today. I saw six people. That's like the world's record there. So nobody goes there. So every day my daughter go there and I go there and we go on a Joppa walk. So we're, we're getting out, we're getting air, we're getting sun and so I think that's important now. I don't know what the rules and regulations are in your city or country, but to be, yeah, to be inside all day, especially if the weather's not good and so forth, is um, it's not good. It's not good. It's a, a difficult environment. So, okay, so now we're dealing with environment versus willpower, but what I just said seemed to contradict it, but... What I meant is that you have, to, you have to use your willpower to also create an environment which is going to support you. So if your environment is not conducive to supporting what you want to do, then you're going to have to alter, you may have to alter your environment. Clean it up, get rid of stuff, whatever it is, get up early. Krishna Priya, when, when I was reading your email, one thing I was thinking is that, and I think this is a good instruction for all of us, if ever you have difficulty some days completing your rounds, then the best thing is just make a vow that I won't do anything until I finish my rounds. That just becomes my lifestyle. And so create an environment in your house where you can do that, a room where you can chant, or just an internal environment that before 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. that the environment in our home, it's just for chanting. We don't do anything else. No computers go on, no phones go on, nothing else happens. So if you, if you try to create that environment and you both do it, then naturally you'll both finish your round. So sometimes you have to do that and just create situations externally that, okay, we're going in our temple room, or we're sitting in front of our altar, and we're not getting up until our rounds are done. Or we're, we're going on a walk, and we're going to walk one hour this way, we're gonna walk, and then we're going to turn around, by the time we get around, it'll be two hours, our rounds will be done. Something like that. All right, every, every day at this time, in the morning, I'm going to chant, this time, you know, something like that. So, you know, we're weak. We're not spontaneously attracted to Krishna. So we have to do things. We have to use our willpower to create situations that will reinforce what we want to do. And the interesting thing is, and this is, this is like a serious problem, when we're being captured by the mode of ignorance, we tend to create environments that are ignorant, which then s reinforce the mode of ignorance. Crazy, right? That's a problem. Isn't it? I am so much wanting to go outside. Because outside right now is beautiful and the sun is setting. Should we go outside? Should we do that? 
having a little sitting here. Maitreya KJ. Maitreya says, I recently heard someone make a comment that humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. But I can immediately think of several quotes from the CC, especially um, especially where devotees like Haridas Thakur and the author himself are actually explaining themselves in demeaning terms. I have a theory about this. That when one is in full bliss and love of God, he doesn't really care about his material identity anymore, and he's happy to denigrate himself. Well, the first point you made, I don't know who said that, and I've heard many devotees quote it, but I've always had a problem with it, because I've never read Prabhupada saying that humility means thinking of yourself less, thinking of yourself is selflessness. Now, I, there may be some connection that when you're humble, you think of yourself less, and I wouldn't deny that. I've just never heard the, the, the definition of humility given in our scripture as thinking of yourself less, although that could be a byproduct. The position of Takara Haridas in denigrating himself, um, it's, it's my understanding is it's actually a symptom of prema. So you say um, he's happy to denigrate himself, and I would say also it's a symptom, it's a byproduct of being happy. That, that's what happens. But the thing to understand is when he denigrates himself, it doesn't have the same effect on him that it has on us because it's coming from prema. And usually when we denigrate ourselves, it's coming from tamagun. So it couldn't be any different. And therefore, when it comes from tamagun, it's a total different effect than when it comes from prema. Right? So that's, that's where devotees get confused. As I say, well, Takaharidas is denigrating himself. You have to excuse me, I have a little allergy. And if you want to empathize with me, what it feels like is ants crawling inside my nose, which is why I'm constantly doing this. It's the nature of the allergy. It actually feels like there's ants crawling around. And now you can empathize with me. It's kind of like a torture, you know, if you want to torture someone, put ants in their nose and don't let them touch their nose. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so, yes, so when we denigrate ourselves on this level, I'm so low, worm and stool, etc., that's generally coming from some kind of false humility which has no benefit or it's coming from the mode of ignorance, which is a, you know, it's either we're denigrating ourselves uh, in an unhealthy way, or we're just misunderstanding the philosophy and thinking I'm supposed to imitate. And you know, Maitreya, so many years we heard, you don't imitate, you follow. So if you're gonna follow the footsteps of Tagaharidas, I always say, why don't you be more respectful to devotees? Why don't you honor and appreciate devotees? Don't, don't try to imitate worm and stool. Try to imitate humility of seeing the good in others, appreciating the good. And that way we're following in the footsteps. But I think a lot of times we try to imitate, oh, Prabhu, I'm the most fallen, I'm lower than worm and stool. That's just pure imitation. You, if you think you're lower than a worm and stool, then you should see your n nearest psychologist because there's something extremely wrong with you. But if you listen to Takaharidas and, and understand philosophically and from, from rasa what's going on, then you try to imbibe that mood. And when you try to imbibe that mood, it's going to come out differently. It's going to come out in the form of, I'm starting to appreciate devotees. More. I'm starting to feel that there's a lot of devotees better than I am. I, I'm, my envy is diminishing. These are the ways that humility manifests for us. And if it doesn't manifest that way, and then we go around saying, I'm lower than a worm in stool, it's basically useless for us. It's not doing anything. It's just avoiding the whole issue. It's like a ploy to avoid the issue of having actually to do the hard work of not criticizing, of serving, of respecting. Isn't it? 
So that, those are my thoughts on that. And I've actually thought about this a lot. And I've, I've taught courses on humility. So I've had to play with this, you know, how these pure devotees are feeling this way. And then as I studied it, I started to understand, no, this is what happens when you're in prema. But then we came across this story that when Prabhupada said, when I die, I'll go to hell. He told that to the devotees, and the devotees said, we'll, we'll go with you. If you go to hell, Prabhupada, we're going with you. He said, no, you're going to Vaikuntha, I'm going to hell. And that doesn't make any sense according to our understanding of reality. It only makes sense when you understand Prabhupada now was kind of putting down his guard as Madhyam Bhakta and going into Uttama. That's how Uttama thinks. Everyone's a devotee except me. And so by Prabhupada saying, I'm going to hell, you're all going to Vaikuntha, he was saying, you're all devotees, I'm not a devotee. So he kind of slipped into Uttama. But if I try to imitate that from the Madhya platform, it doesn't do me any good. Actually, it's harmful. So that was my understanding. When that extreme humility develops, it's developing because they have prema, and that's how someone in prema feels. But for the madhyam, we don't feel that way. We, we won't feel that way until we have prema or bhava. So we have to translate humility into what it means for us. So I'm on the internet, you know, taking part in conversations, criticizing somebody, and then talking about humility. No, no, no. We have to see from where I'm at, what does humility look like for me? Can I appreciate a few people I don't like? Can I compliment a few people that I've criticized? Could I say I'm sorry to a few, few people? Could I forgive a few people? Could I ask for forgiveness? That's, that's where we're at, and those are the things we need to do. But if we're trying to imitate Takaharidas, then what's the point? Because we, we kind of missed the whole boat of what we need. You know, it's like, hey, I'm going to go tomorrow and run 10 miles. I can't even run 100 yards without collapsing. Okay, so why don't you work on 100 yards? Okay, Maitreya says, I run 10 miles. I'm inspired. Wow, so I'm going to run 10 miles? No, I'm going to run 200 yards because yesterday all I ran was 100. But now you've inspired me. You could run 10 miles. I mean, maybe some, maybe if every day I add another 50 yards, someday I could run a few miles. That's practical, right? But to think I'm going to go out and run a, run 10 miles and I can't even run 100 yards without collapsing, it's, it's stupid. So it's the same thing. I hope that answers your question. That's, that's what I could... Um, That's where, that's the conclusion I came to. And I think that story about Prabhupada kind of sealed it because he definitely, he just definitely went into another world of, you know, you're all devotees, I'm not. So Michael, Michael says, I get lost between self-preservation and selfishness. If you're preserving yourself so you can serve, then it's selflessness. If you don't preserve yourself in a way that you can't serve, it's selfishness. I hope that clears that up. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to take care of myself. I don't care. I want to be selfless. And then you're lying on the bed kind of useless, sick, or just uh, not inspired. You don't feel well. You can't do much. That's selfish. Michael, once in Los Angeles, I was present. And it was very interesting what happened. Prabhupada was giving a class. And devotees were coughing. It must have been winter. You know, it's like a cough here, a cough there. And it was got to the point where it's disturbing Prabhupada, and he stopped the class and he said, why are you coughing? And then he turned to the president and said, don't you have give them sufficient warm clothes? You should take care of them. Then he stopped what he was talking about, and he told the story of Sanatana Goswami. And Sanatana Goswami had some kind of sores, I don't know, but they were open sores and they were oozing whatever, pus or blood. And then when Mahaprabhu saw Sanatan, he embraced him. And in deity worship, in dealing with Krishna, you don't allow anything from inside your body to touch Krishna because anything inside your body is considered contaminated. Like if you sneeze, go wash your hands. 
blow your nose, go wash your hands. If a woman is having her menstrual period and she's bleeding, she's not allowed to go on the altar because anything from within contaminates. So now, Borjitani is embracing Sanatana Goswami and now he's touching all these sores and the pus and the blood. And Sanatana Goswami, he was so devastated. This is a story Prabhupada told in the class because people were coughing. He said he's so, he's so devastated that he decided to kill himself. And of course, Lord Chaitanya knows everything. I, either he expressed it or it was just a thought. He said, I've, I've ruined my life. I've offended Lord Chaitanya. Now, Lord Chaitanya said, no. It's like this, to me, your sores are like sandalwood. And embracing you is like the perfection of touch is to embrace a Vaishnava. So, but still, Sanatana Goswami felt horrible. And then Prabhupada said, that Lord Chaitanya told Sanatana, he said, Sanatana, you have no right to kill yourself because your body does not belong to you. It belongs to me. It's my body. You've given it to me. And you have no right without my permission to kill yourself. So that's another way of saying, your body, Michael, does not belong to you. It belongs to Krishna. And it's Krishna's object, so it's your job to maintain it and use it in his service. So your self-preservation is your service to Krishna. If it's self-indulgent, okay, that's another thing. You know, now all of a sudden we go, we go to Las Vegas and we see Michael, you know, he's in the spa, getting his toenails done and his fingernails, and, you know, and the massage, you know, for three hours, and you know, just, okay, that's over the top but you understand what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so Katie says, uh, the mindset of viewing setting boundaries as being inappropriate is a result of upbringing in unhealthy family. Yeah. So if you don't have respect for yourself, you don't set boundaries when people uh, hurt you. So when people are hurting you or doing something um, that's disturbing you or making your life difficult, you have to tell them, you, say, you know, when you do this, it's, it's difficult for me. And you might say, well, if I were more Krishna conscious, maybe I could tolerate it. Okay, but if, it's, if you're not able to tolerate it and it's harming you, and especially in a close relationship, you need to um, express that. Boundaries are necessary. Yeah. So. You've been raised in a way to make yourself feel, you've been made to feel unimportant. Yeah, then you won't express boundaries and you'll allow people to impose uh, negatives on you. So, yes. Okay, how about selling my environment and moving to Alaska? Yeah. Stay in Las Vegas, help them there. There's enough people here. Las Vegas is not a bad environment, is it? I lived in Las Vegas. I, yeah, actually, when I lived there, it, it felt very Thomasic. But there's nice deserts out there. Yeah. So, going outside, getting sun, walking—if it's allowed, it, it actually builds up your immune system. And we, in the class yesterday, which unfortunately, we were going to give you the class, and all I can give you now is the PowerPoint. When I was saving the class, it downloads it, and my wife didn't realize it was being downloaded, and so she left the Zoom program while it was downloading. But we're going to do another class, and it'll be a little more organized. And I've just ordered a device where I can use the webcam as my, my camera as the webcam, and I ordered a little light that I can put on top of the camera so that I can get good lighting everywhere. Like this lighting is just windows, and overhead is not ideal. And I have studio lighting in there, but I don't think I can get internet in that room, and I don't have a desk, so I'm doing it here. So um, and then I think I'll, I'll use, um, I'll get, a USB microphone so I can use an actually good microphone and make a really good recording visually and audio. So so we'll, we're going to do that. But in the class, some of you were there, 
an amazing statistic came up. And they found, this was studied, they studied people, they studied them, they studied couples and they studied their health, and they found that the couples with good relationships were healthier, and people with good marriages were healthier than people who were single. I don't know, maybe for our brahmacharis it's different because they're happy. But the most amazing thing was they found that people who were very contemptuous, which means they're always putting one another down, they were four times more likely to get infectious diseases. What is an infectious disease? I'll give you an example. Coronavirus is an infectious disease. Infectious disease. They were more likely to get colds and flus and viruses when they had this contemptuous relationship, a toxic relationship. That's amazing. That's one of the like most amazing things I ever heard. Almost unbelievable things, but it's documented statistically. So, if you're staying inside and you're getting depressed and you're you know, getting on edge with the people in your house, it's not good for your health. And in a time like this, you want your immune system to be strong. So, yes, get out if you can. Um, the ants aren't in there all the time. Um, it's just kind of a season and I've been reticent to take been reticent to take the allergy medicine because I always try to get rid of it some way but not always successful yeah so now it's time to end the class unless you have something else to say um, what, what I've often said and I'll say it again because I think it's important Prabhupada was not happy when his disciples were not happy and the reason is because when his disciples were not happy, he understood that they're not Krishna conscious. They're, they're doing something wrong. And Prabhupada said something that's interesting in the Bhagavatam. He said that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, when he saw his disciples who were gaining weight, he was very concerned. Now we know that some people will just eat a little bit and they'll get fat. It's their nature. But in any case... Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, when he saw his disciples getting fat, he was thinking they must be overeating or they must be eating very opulent food and they must be sleeping too much or not active enough. So it put him in anxiety, thinking, okay, these people are becoming sensual. They're brahmacharis, they're sannyasis, they're not living the way they should. And so in the same way, when Prabhupada saw that devotees were not happy, you know, it's like, okay, you're doing something wrong because the process of Krishna consciousness will make you happy. And the point of this discussion is that even you have personal problems, but still, in the light of Krishna consciousness, in spite of all your personal problems, the process is blissful, you'll still be happy. That's the point. And if you allow your personal problems to degrade you, that's not Krishna consciousness. If you allow your personal problems to depress you, that's not Krishna consciousness. And I told that story many times, and it's so funny. When Prabhupada had a servant, and the servant was not doing well, and Prabhupada once told him, he said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm tired of looking at your depressed face. Why don't you just go in the closet so I don't have to see you? So it was kind of like saying, Krishna consciousness is blissful and now I'm being surrounded by someone who's not Krishna conscious, who's depressed, who's being influenced by Tamagun and it's just, I don't want to be around that, I don't want to see that. So it doesn't matter the challenges you have, it, it doesn't matter how conditioned you are, it doesn't matter what's happened in your life. If you take the Krishna, if you just ex if you just take whatever you have, whatever ability you have, and just take in stride whatever conditioning is there, and just throw yourself into Krishna consciousness and be happy as a devotee, that's what Prabhupada wants. He doesn't want you to be depressed about, oh, in the past I did so many sinful things, I'm so conditioned. And naturally we feel that way. But in the fire of Krishna consciousness, that all goes away. And the proof of that is, Right from the beginning, when we were devotees, we were feeling blissful. 
blissful kirtans, blissful classes, blissful sankirtan, blissful service. And we were highly conditioned. We were right off the street. But the process was blissful. So it doesn't matter your condition, the process is blissful. And if you think, no, my condition, it's so bad, and you become depressed by it, that's not Krishna consciousness. That is the influence of Kamagun. And it's not what Prabhupada wanted. So you can think about that, you know, if I've got this sad face and I'm depressed, I'm so foul and this and that. And you can think of Prabhupada telling you, go in the closet, I don't want to see your depressed face. So um, I want to see, Prabhupada wants to see your happy face. So it, it be happy, be satisfied in Krishna consciousness. And, and, and that makes Prabhupada happy. You're happy, he's happy. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to see Krishna. He wants you to be happy in Krishna consciousness. If you're happy in Krishna consciousness, that's a great service to Prabhupada. It makes him so happy. He's not happy when you're not happy. Hare Krishna. Okay. Background noise and microphone. I think that is a internet problem. But it's time to end class here. And it was nice that we could speak to everyone in Australia. And those of you who are able, uh, tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock we will continue our discussion, reading from Srila Prabhupada's books on how to leave our body. And a very interesting topic. And uh, I think, actually, tomorrow will be the 14th cl to 12th class on that topic. Something like that. It's a very interesting topic. So thank you all for coming, attending. Thank all of those. Thank you in Europe for staying up so late, South Africa. I hope I made it worthwhile. If you feel this class was of value, then please share it. And we'll see you tomorrow. And um, Hare Krishna. Oh yeah, tomorrow at 7 we're doing, I was asked to do a kirtan. So I'll, I'll give you that information on kirtan. Mm. So Maitreya says, is one, who's, who, one who has been diagnosed with clinical depression, I can assert that Krishna consciousness uh, practice diligently as a cure. At least whilst one is acting in Krishna consciousness. Oh, thank you for saying that. And reading Prabhupada's books, very good. That's encouraging. That is Krishna. Thank you all for coming. And now, Julia, go to sleep. Lucy, go to sleep. Stephanie, stay awake. Talia, stay awake. PC, you can go to sleep also. For PC, it must be, yeah. No, PC, it's the morning. No, don't go to sleep. Katie, go to sleep. Michael, don't go to sleep. It's still early. And my tray doesn't have to go to sleep. And that is Krishna Priya. So, um, and Sundari Radha, it's still early in your day. Okay. Rasika, still early. And my dear God brother, not amazing Gopishta Bidu. Pragosh, also known as Patrick Hedgemark. Is it Hedgemark? Hedgemark, yeah. Pragosh, one of the most amazing Gopishta Bidu's in the history of literature. Pragosh, I want to tell I want to tell everybody something you said that you said a few things that stuck in my mind, but one thing, this was, I don't know if you remember this, but this was in Los Angeles. You were distributing books in Los Angeles. And at this time, there was this Jim Jones ca ca event, and Jim Jones was a cult leader, and he had everybody drink poison, cyanide, and some punch, or whatever they call it, Kool-Aid, and they all died, which is a big thing. Cult leader, you know, mass suicide. So all of a sudden, all the cults like us and the other groups were lumped into this, like dangerous, right? And it was so hard to distribute books. Like nobody could distribute books. And for Ghosh, you were giving class and you were explaining and you said, you know, we didn't always preach so much on book distribution. We just tried to sell a book, say what you had to say to sell the book. And sometimes if you preach too much, you kind of talk them out of taking the book. He said, we never 
He said, but now the only way to sell the book was to preach because they had, people had so many doubts and you had to explain the philosophy so they understood you weren't a cult. So you were saying it was like this was like a um, it was like a point where book distribution changed so much because like Krishna created the situation that forced us to learn how to you know we all know how to preach but how to preach in a way that would interest people to take a book because it was always easier to kind of just say what you knew would what people would say okay okay good you know this book will make you happy and you know relieve stress or whatever. But, um, and you were saying it was like a blessing. We had to uh, learn how to preach. And now we were preaching and people were taking the books by preaching. It was kind of like a, like the next level. It was, I don't know when that was, like the end of 70, 70, 79, 80, 81. It was like, it was like the next level of book distribution was forced upon us because they wouldn't take books unless you did preach because they wouldn't trust you. I don't know if you remember that, but I remember that. I think that was a momentous occasion to be remembered. Okay, thank you all. We will see you tomorrow morning if you want to come. Howdy.